Good morning. Um, I want to thank everyone who came to the uh, question and answer. Did y'all have a good time? Is that fun? Hopefully that will be the first of many. Um, and I've already heard several say that uh, they want to see more of that go on. Um, because, and, and I've already poured out my heart tale about this over and over again. Right? It, you, questions are normal. Doubts are normal. They're part of just walking through life. And so we need to not um, press away from God whenever we have doubts, but press into God seeking answers. Um, but there was one question in particular that came up that got me thinking, because it's a common question, and it was uh, about not feeling as if God loves me. And this question has actually come up a few times at some past events that I've done when I was working with youth. And it was, I don't feel like God is acting in my life. I don't feel like there's something present. I don't feel, I don't see, I don't experience God in my life. And a pretty good answer is that chances are he's there and he's acting. We just don't always recognize it. So before I get into the message for today, I want to do something a little different. Because each and every one of us in here, if we are walking with the Lord, there's one thing that we know that we claim to be true is that He loves us, He provides for us, He cares for us, and He is there with us, ever present. And so I want to ask a question, right? Y'all spent some time asking questions Wednesday. Now it's my turn to ask y'all a question. And I want you to feel free to share. And we'll let a few people share because your sharing might encourage someone else who's going through a dark time saying, I don't feel God. Where are those times, say in the last week or two, where God has acted in your life? An answered prayer, an unexpected blessing, an encouragement, some kind of maybe even supernatural, just encouraging when you had no reason to be encouraged, something, anything where you know that was God acting in my life. Anyone like to share a moment in the, maybe the last couple of weeks where God has acted in your life that could be an encouragement to speak in the lives of your brothers and sisters? Answered prayers that coincidence that was just a little too much of a coincidence? Yes. broke down right in front of the place. Yeah. No, luck had nothing to do with that. That was God providing. Amen. What else? Yes, ma'am. You know, the Bible says that Christ is with us and we are the body of Christ. If Christ is going to be with us, it's through, a lot of times, through our brothers and sisters. And so, amen. It's Christ working. Anyone else before we get rolling? You should never hesitate to share the glory of what God does for us. So often we get busy in our day-to-day routine and we're not looking and seeing what he's doing. But hearing our brothers and sisters say, no, I saw what he was doing. That helps us. Anyone else? No? Okay. Well, 
Today, we are beginning our journey into the Beatitudes. Um, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Should have marked my Bible. Let me find the page. Matthew chapter 5. There we go. That's chapter 1. I, I got to move forward. All right. Um, this starts out Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, his you know, single longest dissertation. He um, see, sees the crowds following him. He goes up onto a mountainside. His disciples gather around him. Kind of the picture we see here is that he's teaching his disciples, but he's letting the crowd have the benefit of the teaching as well. And so um, this is what he goes into, and we're going to walk through this over the next uh, nine weeks counting today. It says, seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so we see here he gives a list of um, just goes through, blessed are these people, and here's why, and blessed are these people, and here's why. Well, before we really dive into that, we'll get into it next week. Well, we're just going to take them one by one and walk through them. What is he talking about? Who is he describing? What's this reward he's saying? But before we do that, I want to look at what does it mean even to be blessed? What is he saying when he says, blessed are? What is he saying? Um, if you look up the word beatitude, the Latin roots of that is it means it's a... Um, uh, supreme blessedness or an extreme happiness. And that word blessed in the Greek, the Greek word there is actually means happy. But the roots of it, interestingly enough, are um, a lengthening of. So, so be, to make something longer, to make something um, further. And so that's, that's kind of an odd word that to mean blessing, to be happiness, or another meaning for it is to be envied. I mean, so you could plug in there that Jesus is saying, happy are those who. To be envied are those who. But whenever you stop and you think, okay, that word meaning an extension of, one commentary I read said that what you see going on here is an extension of God's grace. The blessing that is being received is because God's grace and his providence is extended to the person. And that's really where the focus is. Because if you look at this list, right? If you, I mean, if you just stop and think of the list, don't look at the, what it says, blessed are those who, because. If you just look at what it says, blessed are those. If he didn't include the why. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Those who mourn the meek, right? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, right? Some of these people, these are people, they, they get walked all over in life. These are the ones who can't get ahead anywhere. The pure in heart, the peacemakers, the, those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Happy are those who are persecuted. To be envied are those who are persecuted, who mourn, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are meek, who, who are the peacemakers, right? The ones who are always having to be the one to make the peace. It's not your fault. You shouldn't have to apologize, but hey, you know what? Someone has to make the peace, but it's always me. Why is it always me, right? Those people are to be envied. That's what he's saying here. Those people are happy. Doesn't sound very happy, 
right? According to our culture, according to our way of life, according to the values of the society we walk in, these aren't happy things. You want to be happy? You don't go after these. It's not what our world teaches, but it's what Christ is teaching. And as we know in so many areas, what Christ teaches is countercultural to what the world would tell us. But if we look at what it is that he is saying, you know, happy are, blessed are, to be envied are these people. Why? And he gives us that list as well along with it. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They will be comforted. They shall inherit the earth. They will be filled. They shall obtain mercy. They shall see God. They shall be called sons of God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you look at this list, aside from one or two, they're all future tense. They're all things that we don't have yet. Blessed are you who are in this bad situation because something good's coming. And it's easy to go, yeah, but something good ain't here now. I'm still in this bad situation. Why am I to be happy? Why am I to be envied? Why should I feel blessed? I'm not feeling very blessed right now. Especially if you're in the midst of mourning, right? Happy are those who mourn. I'm not feeling very happy. He says, well, yeah, but you will be comforted. Well, I'm not comforted right now. Isn't that the way our attitudes like to go? So what is going on here that we would be blessed if we are in this situation, if one of these describes us? It's focus. Right? And we've talked about this before, how it's our focus on God, on Christ, on Him, on what is to come, on what He offers, on what He promises, not on ourselves and not on the here and now. It's all about focus. Like I said to the kids, right? You get happy and excited about something, you don't actually have anything. Right? Let's look at some real world, real world examples on this. Let's say for an instant, because I know you're all good Baptists and you never gamble, let's say you find a winning lotto ticket. Right? What's the Powerball up to? Did anybody win? Like a half a billion dollars? You find a ticket and you look and you go, oh, that's the winning numbers. I have a ticket with the winning numbers. And you're excited and you're happy and you're showing your friends and you're telling people, I have a lottery ticket with the winning numbers. Do you have half a billion dollars? No, you have a little piece of paper in your hand. Why are you so happy? Because what the paper promises is to come. Amen? 13 years ago, 14 years ago, I asked my wife, who was not my wife at the time, I asked Molly, will you marry me? And in a moment of temporary insanity, she said yes. <laughs> and I was ecstatic. I think I even cried. I was happy. I was overjoyed. I was overwhelmed with happiness. Why? Did I have a wife? No. I had a promise. But it hadn't happened yet. But it was coming. And I knew it was coming. And so I could take joy in what I had. Let's say you have a, a, a relative that um, you find out uh, that you've been written into their will. They don't look like they're going anywhere anytime soon, right? But you're happy because you know whatever they're leaving you, it's going to be good. You love this. It's a grandparent, aunt, uncle, somebody. Maybe they have money. Maybe it's some item that they have that they're leaving to you or whatever, and you're happy because you're going to receive that. But they're healthy as an ox. They're not going anywhere but you're still happy. Why? Do you have whatever the inheritance is? No. But you know it's coming. And in the same way, Jesus' message to us here is, you know what, blessed are those because what's coming for them. So if you look at this list and that's one of you, maybe you're mourning, maybe you're meek, maybe you're the one who always has to be the peacemaker. Whatever it is, he's saying, you know what? Blessed are you, because it's coming. Take your eyes off of whatever the situation is that you're in. Take your eyes off of whatever you lack. Stop thinking about what you lack and look at what's coming, what he has promised. Right? Sorrow may last for a night, but what comes in the morning? Joy. And I think that's really where it gets down to. 
We're talking about the Beatitudes. We're talking about happiness. We're talking about blessedness. And I've said over and over again, and I'm going to keep saying it, and hopefully it'll sink in, that our happiness is found where? In God. The way he designed the world to work is that our joy, our fulfillment, our satisfaction, our contentment is found in him. And so much of our problems come from whenever we focus not on him, but on the things of this world or on ourselves. And we seek pleasure in what he has created. So rather than worshiping the creator, we just want his stuff. Right? We give our fulfillment of life in what the world can give us, in relationships, in jobs, in money, in success. And it never really fulfills because it was never meant to. Awesome things, wonderful things, good things that he made for our benefit. But they make a crummy God. Only he is God. And we are made for him, for his glory. And whenever, it's this weird thing that's just the way it's wrapped up. When we live not for our own pleasure before his glory, we end up getting our pleasure. Because we're designed to live for his glory. C.S. Lewis said it, um, and I'll probably butcher this, but he said it, um, if you try to live for earth instead of heaven, you'll lose both heaven and earth. But if you live for heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. And so much of our focus, it's on what we lack It's on what our present situation is. It's chasing after the temporary cheap happiness, cheap pleasure that we get from the finite things of this world that don't last. We chase after those instead of after God, but if we follow after Him, we get our happiness. Because here's a crazy thing. Do you think possibly it might be that the creator of the universe who designed it knows best how it should work? Because this is what we do in our relationships. No, thank you, God. I'm not going to follow your way because I know what's going to make me happy. And then it doesn't. Right? Most of us have been around a little bit. We know we've learned the hard way how not to do it. If only we'd listen to God in the first place. He designed it. He knows how it's supposed to work. Money is not a bad thing. It helps us. It gives us things we need, we're able to purchase food and provide for family. But whenever money becomes the thing we want and we go about obtaining it through unethical ways, it doesn't work out. Why? Because that's not the way he designed it to work. If we would just do it his way in the first place. Now, that's not a promise. Everything's always going to go right every time. I don't think I can say this enough. We live in a broken, fallen world. Nothing is ever going to go always right all the time because we're all sinful, broken people. We all have pride. We all have selfishness. We all want the things we want. And whenever you get two broken people together, they're going to break some more stuff. So even the greatest, most wonderful relationships are going to have its problems. Why? Because you put any two sinners in a room together, you're going to have problems. Put two people together. You put a group of people together together things will just happen that are not the way they're supposed to. However, God has designed his world to work a certain way. And if you follow that design more often than not, it's going to go better than not. And even when it doesn't, and we find ourselves lacking, we find ourselves in unwanted situations, we find ourselves mourning, we find ourselves pressed down, pushed down, Christ's word to us is, blessed are you because of what's coming. Take your eyes off of where you are and look at what's coming. I told this story before and I think it's just so funny because this is exactly how so many of us respond. Let's imagine you've been told that um, you have an inheritance, you have something coming to you, you an unknown relative, whatever, left Um, an inheritance to you and all you have to do is go down and sign the paperwork and it is yours. So you jump in, you're busted up, breaking down, running on prayer car and you're heading down to the courthouse and you're about half a mile away and that busted up car finally sputters its last and it dies on the side of the road. Now, if I say, what do you do? 
I know we're all going to answer. You get out of the car and you'll walk the rest of the half mile to go get your inheritance because that's what's coming. But this is an analogy. But what do we do actually in life? We get out, we curse it, we get upset, and we stand there next to our busted up, broken life, griping about it, complaining about it, rather than getting up, looking up on what is to come and going after what has been promised to us. We stay where we are and we gripe and complain about the broken life when the new life that's been promised is so much greater. Amen? Jesus Christ did not come live his life to teach us about and show us about a better way and then die on that cross to purchase our forgiveness and give us a new life so that we can sit here and grumble about the one we have that's broken. Because he promises renewal. He promises healing. He promises comfort. But too much, we keep our eyes downcast complaining about where we are now. And I don't want to downplay your pain. Because I know for a fact, sitting in this room, there is pain. And that's real, and it's nothing wrong with feeling that. But we should not let what happens to us in this life drag us down and keep our eyes downturned to the situations we're in. But we should look up, turn our eyes upon Jesus. Right? That's how the song goes. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace take our eyes off of the situation we're in. Jesus said, blessed are you because of what is to come. So let's stop looking at where we're at and look at what is to come.